Uh, We're going to continue in the book of John chapter 5 today. We're going to be in verses 25 through 29. And I want to just give some background. We jumped to Psalm 146 last week. Uh, So Jesus is in Jerusalem. Uh, He has healed a man, and it's the Sabbath. And uh, the Jews at large, the rulers of the Jews, are really upset with Jesus because he healed somebody on the Sabbath. Now, as Jesus responds to them, he makes some very startling claims that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he says, you know, in verse 17, my father is working until now and I am working. He tells them, God the Father has never stopped working. The Sabbath isn't for God, it's for man. He's always been working and I'm still working whenever I need to be working. Well, he's then declared himself God by saying he is the son of God, and he's declared himself God by saying that he's working on the Sabbath and the Jews can't tell him what to do. This was a very controversial statement. And then in verses uh, 18 through 24, Jesus just gives this absolute tirade of of doctrine about who he is. Uh, He says, True, in verse 19, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. He says, I do the works of the father. Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Well, now he's saying that he is doing the, the miracles of God, the marvels that God does, the son does. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life, or gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. He said, I have the power of life within me. He says in verse 22, he talks about in 23, about the honor and the judgment that belong to Jesus. And in verse 24, he caps it off, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. That's what we're going to talk about today in verses 25 through 29. We see the resurrection and judgment that come for the unbeliever and the believer. Now, this is a rather short passage, and uh, it's pretty plainly stated. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look into what the Bible has to say about our eternal state. We're going to look to see what the Bible has to say about resurrection and about judgment. Now, Within Orthodox Christianity, there's a lot of different opinions on what happens after we die. Most everyone says you go to heaven, and then eventually Jesus is coming back and everything's fixed, right? That's, everyone agrees there, but what happens within that, those time frames varies from church to church, from teaching to teaching. Uh, if you're familiar with these theological premises, uh, Peak Bible Church is a dispensational, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial Bible church. Um, We don't believe that the millennium is happening now. We don't believe that there's no millennium. Uh, We're going to walk through some of that. But if you're wondering ahead of time, you're going to be worried the whole time. That's where we stand. So if you have issue there, I'll tell you why the Bible says we're right. Um, But there's a lot of people that are way smarter than I am that believe very differently. Um, Like, Classic example is R.C. Sproul. He's dead now, uh, but R.C. Sproul is not as dispensationalist, but he's a great brother. I'm thankful for what he taught. I've got his app on my phone. I listen to his messages all the time. Uh, We can disagree on some of these things and yet still say these are good brothers and sisters in Christ. And so if there's some of you here today that disagree with us, I would say we can still disagree on these things and say we can be brothers and sisters in Christ. You just won't teach those positions here at Peak. So... Uh, Let's read verses 25 through 29. And well, let me back up first. Don't let those statements lead you to believe that this is just some kind of theological thing we're going to be walking through and it's academic and it's not understandable or we can't know what happens because every one of us should care what's going to happen to us when we die, right? That's a pretty significant fact. In fact, it's the most important thing in all the world. So I, this is some, there's some theological nuance to this, but I think it's really important and very applicable. So John chapter five, beginning in verse 25, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. 
For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that those that are in Jesus Christ have a promised future that doesn't end in the resurrection of judgment. I thank you, Lord, that we can look ahead and see a resurrection of life, not because we're good and not because we're worthy, not because of what we have accomplished or done, not because of decisions we've made, but because of your grace and sending your one and only son to take the penalty for our sins on the cross that we might have a relationship with you. I pray, Father, as we consider this text, as we consider our future, that you would be glorified and we would be excited about what is coming. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, Jesus begins in verse 25. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So we have a problem that we all have to deal with, and that problem is death. We have to handle this in some fashion. God created the world and everything that's in it. He put Adam and Eve in the midst of the garden, and Adam and Eve were subsequently deceived by uh, Satan, the snake, and fell into death. So everyone faces death at some level. This led to death for every man, woman, and child to ever live. Everyone is going to die. And this isn't just physical death. The, the world around us would look and say, yep, everyone dies. We know that. Uh, there are folks trying to prolong life. They're going to die at some point. Maybe we figure out some stuff and figure out what causes all the cancer and heart disease and really just eat good food and move, right? But like, we'll figure all that out and people will live to be 120 years before their hearts give out. But everyone's gonna die. There's no way around it. The man that has lived the longest has died. There's two exceptions to people that have died, right? Elijah's taken up in a chariot of fire and Enoch walked with God. Those are the special examples. And if you're waiting for the chariot, go do something else because it's not coming. Um, now, maybe we'll talk about this in a little bit. Maybe Jesus comes back and you don't have to physically die. That's a blessing. Lord, please come soon. Um, but by and large, everyone's going to die. So we have this massive problem of death, and it's not just physical death, but apart from Christ, we continue to die, and we live in a realm of spiritual death. And there's sin in us, and there's brokenness. Even Israel demonstrated this over and over again, right? You have Adam and Eve that sin in the garden, and then physical death is coming, but spiritual death happens at that moment. They are then alienated from God. They can no longer walk with him. They have to be cast out of the garden, and their life is going to be really, really hard. But repentance, there's a promise then that Jesus is going to come and, and fix this, this Redeemer. And we don't know at, one po at what point Adam and Eve are, are redeemed, right? Uh, we assume they're going to be in heaven, um, but we don't know at what point their hearts changed, but we know that spiritual death came um, right after the fall there because they chose to rebel against God. But even after Adam and Eve, Israel demonstrated this repeatedly. God gave Adam and Eve instruction in the garden. Well, Israel had instruction with the law. God said, live this way. And Israel said, yes, we will. And then they didn't. Well, Adam and Eve walked with God. They had his presence with them, right? Israel had the Holy of Holies there. They, in the wilderness, they followed a cloud and fire. They had the presence of God with them, and yet they didn't follow God. Adam and Eve filled their side of the covenant for an unknown period of time. They stewarded the garden. They cared for it. We don't know how long it was after Eve was created till the fall, but there's some period where they held their side of the covenant. Well, Israel promised to fill, fulfill their side of the covenant, and they failed. So even Israel demonstrates this fall, and we demonstrate this fall, right? The Bible says that uh, what is 
important about God in Romans 1 is, is clearly known, right? You can look at the mountains and say there is a God. You can look at, at the, a grass or a human or, or a blade of grass, a human. You can look at an insect and say there has to be a God, and yet we deny him. But Jesus says here that an hour is coming. We live in the state of physical and spiritual death. An hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And this presents an already not yet statement from Christ. And we're going to think about this already not yet kind of principle because it applies to this very well. Because there are folks that know Christ as their Lord and Savior. I hope that's you here today. And you have already been given life. You've already been resurrected from the dead in a spiritual sense, but you're awaiting a physical resurrection to come. So we have an already not yet statement from Jesus here. And we hear the voice of Son of, or sorry, we hear the voice of the Son of God when we come to Christ in salvation and you have spiritual life. So that's the already. If you're here today, you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And now you've been made alive to walk with Christ. So you were dead, you're now alive. A miracle has happened in the life of everyone here. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were dead and now you're alive. Well, there's some confusion here because he's going to get into a lot of stuff about physical resurrection. And we know that because he talks about tombs and things of that nature. But... We all await a physical resurrection too. Do you think about that much? Like I typically think, okay, I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. When I die, I get to go to heaven and then we're kind of done. I know everything from there out is good. So why worry about, worry about it too much? But we look at Jesus calling Lazarus out of a tomb and we say, that's really cool. Like he, there was a man dead in a tomb and he raised him up from death, from death, and the man walked out and lived for a while longer, and then he died again. But he was resurrected, and he lived. It's going to be a lot cooler when Jesus comes back, and the dead in Christ rise first, and every single human body that's been burned to ashes, that was buried and decaying, that was dropped into the ocean, whatever the case might be, every one of them that knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be resurrected and restored in a moment. And you get a physical body, right? I hope not the same one, right? No, there's a, we're, they're glorified bodies. Uh, but we have pains now. We have difficulty now. Uh, I really hope either in heaven, in my glorified body, I'm a little shorter or doors are a little taller. Um, it's inconvenient. And it hurts, but there's lots of stuff about our bodies that will change, but we're looking forward to this glorified body. So the voice of, son of, of the Son of God brings physical life at the point of the rapture. So you're wondering, hey, when do I get my glorified body? Do you get it at the point of the rapture? The hour that is coming is a day when our bodies will be resurrected to reign with Christ in the millennium. We'll exist with God through the tribulation in heaven and then be brought back down to earth to reign with him. We'll discuss the timing of tribulation here in a little bit. But we'll be brought back down to reign with him, and that's when we get to experience life in a physical sense. So he says an hour is coming. So the coming hour is the rapture. That's when those that hear the voice of the Son of God live. But an hour is now here, that's the spiritual life that you have now. The now here, that's the already, the spiritual life you have now. The not yet is the hour that's coming. It's the hour when we will be physically resurrected to live with Christ. He says in verse 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. The Son has been granted the power of life. Does this mean that there was a time when the Son of Man did not have life in himself. We would say no. John's already cleared that up for us. Back in chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, In him, in the Word, in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. 
So life ex has existed in Jesus for all of eternity, but the authority, when Jesus comes and he, he takes on human flesh and he lays aside the, as we said in past weeks, the independent exercise of some of his divine attributes, he, la he lays those aside. And now, he, as a person, God still gives him, grants him the authority to exercise life, to give life. And there is life in three different fashions. We already discussed uh, life in the form of physical resurrection from the dead. In John chapter 11, we'll get to in who knows how long. Uh, John chapter 11, verses 1 through 44, he can give physical life. He gave it to Lazarus. And one day he will give it to lots of people, but that point's coming. Uh, but he would give physical life um, while he was here on earth. Second, he can give life in the form of spiritual birth. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, Paul 12 tells us, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. You have life in Jesus Christ. There's a spiritual new birth that happens into you. And then as we discussed uh, with the life that comes at the point of the rapture, he can bring ultimate resurrection. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. But we're going to get to that passage a little more thoroughly here in a little bit. So he gives life in three forms. Physical resurrection while he was here on earth. He gives spiritual birth um, when the when a person comes to know Christ, and then he can bring ultimate resurrection that we'll see in the future. In, in verse 27, it says, And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now we're going to spend a while here before we get into verses 28 and 29, because this is a really significant section and a lot of other stuff flows out of it. It says Jesus is the Son of Man. Well, that doesn't sound like a very special term, right? I am a son of man. I, my dad's name is Charles King. Uh, he gave, well, he didn't give birth to me, uh, but my mother gave birth to me 36 years ago, and uh, I am a, the son of a man. But this was still Christ's favorite term for himself. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7. In verses 13 and 14. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. So there is a son of man that comes that is presented before the father. That son of man is Jesus. This is where that favorite title for Christ, uh, of Christ for himself comes from. Verse 14 says, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is the, the ultimate being in all the universe, right? The Son of Man comes before the Ancient of Days, comes before God, and then you see what he's given, and what he's given tells you that he's God, right? The, the fact that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him, that his dominion is everlasting, it won't pass away, his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Folks, Jesus did come and he did die to redeem his people, right? He came to, he, he died to redeem us, that we might have relationship with him, that we might get to know him. But he came to establish this dominion, this kingdom for himself. You know, we say probably the crowning point, the, the final thing in, in all of scripture is when the new heaven comes down, right? The new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem's there. But the moment that initiates all of that is in Revelation 5 when Jesus walks up to God and takes the scroll from his hand. And, and this is a title deed to all of creation because he is the son of man that is worthy to receive this kingdom. This is 
what was given to him, this dominion, this kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Everyone is going to serve God. Everyone will bow down before Jesus, recognizing that he is Lord. Now, there are those that will not like how they end up having his glory demonstrated through him for all of eternity because they'll be in judgment and hell. And then there are those that will enjoy him forever. But no matter which way you look at it, everything goes to Jesus. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will bow before him. It's not an option. You can bow before him now and enjoy him, or you can bow before him as one that comes under judgment. The, there's not a, I said in sermons a while ago at Mesa Hills, it, it's not like God's throwing a Hail Mary pass and hoping everything turns out okay. Right? This isn't jumping up in the end zone and maybe he'll come down with the ball. This is predetermined in eternity past. And we see it here in Daniel, fleshed out a long time before Christ or God gives uh, John the vision in Revelation. That judgment's coming, the dominion's coming, and Christ is going to go, and the Son of Man will walk before the Ancient of Days, and he will receive what is rightfully his. Back in John, he says he's given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. That authority comes because the kingdom and the dominion is his. It belongs to Jesus. Now, judgment has always been his, and it will be for all of eternity. Even in the incarnation, he had the power given him to execute judgment. Because he is the Son of Man. So, we, we think about this judgment that's coming. We think about this, this resurrection that's going to happen, this life that we're going to get to. In verse 28, he says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So we have to ask, what happens to us when we die? People are going to come out. They're going to be resurrected. That means you have to die first. You can't be resurrected unless you're dead. What happens to us when we die? We know that every person ever born under the curse of sin exists in a, a state of spiritual death. We know that death is not natural. We say, oh, this is the natural uh, process of things. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 that says that death is the final enemy to be destroyed. Right? Death is the enemy of God. God did not create death death in the garden. Adam and Eve were intended to live forever, right? Brokenness, sin, death, it's not supposed to happen, but man brought that. And because of that, we all die. It's the biggest problem anyone will ever face, right? Everything you do is in an effort to not die. You work, you eat, you try and take care of yourself. All of these things go together to preserve life, to let you be around longer. It's the biggest problem that any, any of us face. But the spiritual curse that leads us into sin, the spiritual curse that all of mankind is under, if you don't know Christ, that leads you to hell and judgment. So Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment. Everyone dies, and then everyone goes into a place of judgment. And this immediate place of judgment is just one that determines whether you're one of God's children or whether you're not. So let's start first with the unbeliever's intermediate state, right? So we're going to talk about an intermediate state for the believer and the unbeliever. Uh, this is what happens right after you die. Then we're going to talk about a uh, kind of a transition state during the tribulation and millennium for the believer. And then we're going to talk about the eternal state. So, and that one will be for the believer and unbeliever. Uh, the unbeliever stays in the intermediate state until the end of the millennium. They're in the, the same place. So let's think through this. And first, we want to make sure that we recognize we're not talking about our bodies anymore. 
once you're dead, your body's gone, we deal with that again later. Uh, during the intermediate state, you don't have to worry about your body or where your body is. Now, uh, you have a soul, some would say a soul and a spirit or a soul slash spirit, and then you have your body. I think it's really unhelpful for us to think about a soul, a spirit, and a body. Um, that gets like your uh, intellect slash thinking side, uh, your spirit, which relates to God, and then your body, which is the physical. I think that's unhelpful because the soul spirit are so closely intertwined and connected. Scripture speaks to them as though they're the same, and a lot of problems come when we divide the two. Uh, one big problem, you may think, why does that matter? Um, some would say, well, I need a pastor to help me deal with, or a church or the Bible, whatever, to help me deal with my spirit. And then I need a psychologist to help me deal with my soul. And I need a doctor to help me deal with my body. Um, that's not the way the scriptures lay it out. The soul spirit are so closely intertwined that we deal with them as one because you're thinking is determined by what happens around you. It's determined by your worldview. It is determined by what you really believe. So I think it's really unhelpful. If you have questions about that, um, if you don't know, I'm a biblical counselor too. Uh, we can discuss the dichotomy, the soul, spirit, and body, two parts, versus trichotomy, soul, spirit, body, at another time. Um, but look at soul, spirit, and body. It's more helpful in your thinking that way. So you die, and then your soul, spirit remains. The unbeliever's soul is separated from his body, and unbelievers go to Hades, a place of torture, immediately. Now, due to time constraints, we're not going to jump to all of these passages, but if you want more information here, it's described by Jesus in Luke uh, 16, verses 19 through 31. But it is an immediate place of torment. Um, there's no such thing as purgatory. There's no working your way to get to heaven. Uh, there's not annihilation. You don't just die and you're gone. You die and you go to Hades. And we know it's a place of torment because the rich man's crying out for even a drop of water to touch his tongue. And then he's crying out that someone would go and tell his loved ones that uh, they should repent so they don't end up where he is. So the unbeliever goes to Hades, this place of torment, immediately. And that's where the unbeliever stays until they go to the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium. Uh, this is not a comfortable place to be, and we know that they will be there for a minimum of 1,007 years. Uh, if you die right now and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then Jesus comes back the next second, you have 1,007 years until the great white throne judgment happens because you have a seven-year tribulation and then a thousand-year millennium until the great white throne judgment. So you have a while laid out until this judgment occurs. That's what awaits the unbeliever right now if they die until the end of, end of the millennium. Now, the believer is intermediate state. The believer at the point of death is transported to be with Christ, right? Jesus told the thief on the cross, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, what is that like? We know it's with Jesus, it's in heaven, the spiritual heaven. Um, but what are the kind of characteristics of it? Let's look at Revelation I'll read 5.10 quickly, and then we'll go to verse, uh, chapter 6 for us to get some idea of what's happening here. And it's important to know that there's not a way to get a really super thorough, worked-out doctrine of all of these things, right? The, the doctrine of salvation in the Bible, we can go point by point and define man's inability, man's depravity, God's intervention, um, these, uh, the, these doctrines of what happens to us after we die, we take from what Jesus has said and what we see in Revelation happening with believers that are there. Paul doesn't lay this out for us like he does a lot of other doctrines or take your uh, apostle, right? Your author of scripture. Um, it's not laid out as clearly, but there's certainly plenty for us to have confidence in what's coming. So uh, in Revelation 5, this is the throne room scene where Jesus takes the scroll and uh, he says, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. So we know that a reign is coming for uh, the believer. But in chapter 6, verse 9, it says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. So these are martyrs. 
that have, have died for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the word, and uh, we're, we can take some of what we know by what these folks say and see. So the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they have borne, they cried out for a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So we know that in heaven, we will be looking forward. We will have knowledge of what's coming. We'll be looking forward to the kingdom that, that Jesus is bringing. So we, we have some kind of future view going on because we know what's coming. Verse 11, it says, Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been killed. So they know they, there's a knowledge of world events. Uh, we don't know what that will look like, but we may have some idea of what's going on. We know at least uh, the, the suffering that's going to happen for believers that are there. And then they remember the past and look forward to the future. There's self-awareness. Um, this is all wrapped up in what we see here in verses 9 through 11. So we'll know who we are. We'll, we'll know what's going on in the world. We'll be able to look back and look forward to when we will reign. But as the unbeliever's body dies and remains on earth, so the believer's body dies as well. Our soul is transported to heaven with Christ and remains there until the rapture when we will be reunited. Uh, our bodies will be reunited with our spirits. That's out of 1 Thessalonians. I'll jump there quickly. Uh, verses 13 through 18, Paul says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. That means those that have died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So those that died will go first. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will, will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So a rapture is coming. The dead in Christ shall rise first. You will get a new body to be reunited with your spirit, and uh, that's the body you will have in during the tribulation period with Christ and then coming back down to earth um, during the millennial reign of Christ when he comes back and starts working everything out. Now, there is an exception here, and that is, of course, for those that live until the point of the uh, rapture. Maybe you don't die, dead go first, then you get to go, your body is taken up. And I'm going to give uh, just four quick reasons um, why I believe in a tribulation, pre-tribulational rapture. And there's a great article in the Master Seminary Journal uh, from Richard Mayhew on this. This is where these points came from. The first is that broadly, when you look at the book of Revelation, in chapters 1 through 3, the word church is used 19 times. And then the rapture happens. This uh, judgment tribulation period starts to come. And it's not used again until chapter 22. Not once. During the entire period of judgment, do you see the word church used? Uh, why would you use it 19 times at the beginning of the letter uh, or beginning of, of this revelation and then not use it again until uh, Jesus is already back and the kingdom, or sorry, Jesus is back the whole time, but the kingdom's established? Um, it doesn't make sense. I think that, that uh, the church has pulled out them. Uh, in the whole of scripture, we never see uh, the church in Israel as the center of God's redemptive priority at the same time. It's always done separately. In the Old Testament, it was Israel. Uh, you move through, even Jesus is coming. He says first to um, the Jews, and then Pentecost happens, and the shift happens to an emphasis on the church. So uh, we never see them happen at the same time. And in the tribulation period, the focus is on Israel and the 144,000. So I don't think that uh, the church is involved there for that reason as well. If the rapture is post-trib, post-tribulational, that's kind of the main arguments. You have uh, pre-tribulational, mid-tribulational, and post-trib. 
uh, the two most prominent positions are pre-trib and post-trib, before the seven years of judgment and after the seven years of judgment. Um, but if the rapture is post-tribulational, there is no purpose to it. Christ is coming to establish his kingdom. They would be there for it anyway. So if the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation, you like go up and come right back down. I don't see, because we see very clearly a rapture in First Thessalonians, I don't see that as having any point here uh, in a post-tribulational view. The next is the separation of the believer from the unbeliever will already happen at the end of the tribulation. Again, it becomes redundant. The believer is to be taken out of the world before the tribulation occurs. Um, otherwise, the believer is taken out of the world and judgment happens and there's no separation there for God's judgment to come. If, pre if tribulational believers are raptured at the end of the tribulation, we would ask who populates the millennial kingdom and where do the enemies of God come from? Uh, when the tribulation happens, the church is taken out, and then there's seven years when some people will come to know Christ. Well, those people don't have new glorified bodies, right? They're not made new. They're still living into the millennium. Now, if they are raptured and receive these new glorified bodies, we find ourselves in a problem with what we're told happens in Revelation, because during the millennium, those people will have children. And some of those children will choose to rebel against God. That's where the armies at the great battle come because uh, they have chosen to rebel against God even though they see him in the millennial kingdom. If uh, all believers are raptured at the end of the tribulation, you don't have people that have unglorified bodies. There's nowhere to get that army from, and we wonder what happens there. And then finally, the post-trib rapture eliminates the time frame for the Bema Seat Judgment and the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And there's uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5, Revelation 19. Um, you can see those things there. But all those details to say the, tribulation, the rapture happens at the beginning of the tribulation. Uh, the final fourth reason, none of the epistles present any warning of the tribulation to come. If Paul knew we were going to be here for it, I think there would be preparation. Peter, James, pick any of them. Uh, it's never mentioned at all until um, we get to John's revelation. So um, the believer during the tribulation and the millennium. We've talked about the unbeliever's intermediate state. They're in Hades. The believer's intermediate state. They're in heaven with God. Until the rapture occurs, we receive new bodies. The believer receives his glorified body at the point of the rapture, and then the Bema Seat judgment or the judgment seat of Christ occurs. Now, this the occasion of the Bema Seat judgment happening. We talk about all judgment being given to Jesus. Uh, this is in debate. Some people think you die and then you face this judgment. I believe it's better understood to happen at the point of the rapture. All believers are brought together and will be judged. Now, this becomes kind of scary. Because you think, hey, I know Jesus. He's accepted the penalty for my sins. Um, I don't have to face judgment. Well, you face this judgment. Uh, every believer will face the Bema seat judgment. Real briefly, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 15. First Corinthians 3.12 says, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day, that's this judgment, will disclose it. Because it was revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If the work that has been done, or if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a, a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, we know that this cannot be a time of loss of salvation, right? 1 Corinthians 3.15 says, if you're at this judgment, you can escape as though by fire. We're going to discuss that more in a minute, but that's not where you want to be, right? It also can't be punishment of any sort. Because Romans 8.1 says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you can't lose your salvation at this judgment. You can't be punished for it. But I do believe that 
there is negative stuff that happens here because in verse 15 it says he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved but only as through fire one commentator put it this way he said the loss could be the realization and awareness of lost opportunities for christ and deep remorse for wasting valuable opportunities to bring god glory and to gain greater eternal reward you may sit there at the bema seat judgment and say i could have done so much more for Christ. But I wasted my life. Folks, you don't want to be one of the ones that escapes, but only is through fire. You don't want to look at your entire life and have this big giant stick and hay castle built that evaporates in a second when fire hits it. We want to use our lives well. 1 John 2.28 says we, or the idea here is that we need to live so that we will not be ashamed at his coming. Would you look at your life now and say, if I died today, and I'm in that intermediate state, but then when the rapture happens, I get my glorified body, I have to stand in front of Jesus and say, my life was a waste. Could you say right now that it's all gold and jewels? Is it silver, precious stones? Or is it wood, hay, and straw? The Bema Seat judgment is coming. So after that judgment, we live in our resurrected bodies through the uh, tribulation. We come back with Jesus when he establishes his millennial kingdom, and we live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. This whole time, the unbeliever has been in Hades. So what about the unbeliever's eternal state? The unbeliever is brought from Hades at the end of the millennial reign of Christ to be judged at the great white throne judgment. And that's in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. It says, then I saw, no, oh, that's in 19. That's a really cool passage, but we're not going to read that. Uh, that's scary. It's one of my favorite parts. Uh, verse 11, chapter 20. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the Lamb's, or in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The destiny of the unbeliever is to be resurrected from Hades after at least a thousand and seven years to stand before God and then to face eternal judgment in the lake of fire because their name was not found written in the book of life. It is torment and unspeakable horror for all of eternity. Now, they are no longer just in the spirit here. That's back in John chapter 5 when he says, uh, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. They will receive a resurrected body. The believer receives a body that is built to enjoy God for all of eternity and to never die. The unbeliever receives a body that is built to withstand the torment of God's judgment for all of eternity. They will come out of the tombs. But they will come out of the tombs to judgment. Now for the believer, the believer's eternal state the believer's name is found here in the Lamb's book of life. We read about the great white throne judgment. But the believer retains his glorified body and exists in the new heavens and new earth with Jesus as their light and in his glory for all of eternity. Revelation 21, 23. So back to John chapter 5. He tells us the dead hear the voice of the Son of God right now, the spiritually dead, and are born again to spiritual life. The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God in the coming hour, and those who know Christ as their Lord and Savior will receive a resurrected body at the rapture. That's verse 25. The Son of God judges and gives life. He will be the one 
at the great white throne because all judgment has been given to Jesus. He will be the one at the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat because all judgment has been given to Jesus. In verses 28 and 29, when all the dead hear the voice of the Son, believers go into eternal life, the unbeliever is resurrected to eternal punishment. So what do we do with this? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, this is the future. You can't get around it. You can't beat God. Satan thinks he can. He can't. Judgment's coming. Repent of your sins and turn to him. He says if you believe that Jesus came and he died on the cross to save you from your sins, you repent of those sins and turn to him, you will be saved. But what about for the believer? Know that a judgment's coming. Right? It's, there's different opinions on this, but no one gets past the great white throne. Right? The folks that don't, that don't believe there's a millennial reign of Christ, they still say the great white throne's happening. So regardless of what you think happens between now and then, judgment's coming. Know that judgment comes and tell other people about Jesus and what he's done. And don't be afraid to tell them about the judgment. No, Jesus isn't just a fire escape from hell. Right? He's the God of the universe. He deserves rightful worship. But judgment's coming, and I don't want anyone to be there. The Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Tell others about him. You have a job to do. But then for the believer also, you can know that a judgment's coming and rest in the fact that he has the authority to give life and to judge. You look at the world around you and you don't like what's happening. Things seem to be falling apart all over the place, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. And you look at this and you just go, oh man, what are we going to do? Take courage. Verse 26, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. The one that came and died for you, has life in himself. He will call your dead and decaying body to resurrection. What happens to us in the few remaining years of our lives is not, is not our greatest concern. Look to that resurrection moment and know in verse 27, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Judgment's coming. So when you look at the wicked world around you, know that judgment's coming. Now I'm going to go read Revelation 19, 11. Then I saw heaven open to behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses." From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the one that judgment's been given to. By the, it, he's the one that made all things, right? God the Father gives Jesus this judgment even in his incarnation to come and to fix it all. No army, the Taliban, Russia, China, pick your person. No one can stand against this Christ, against this Messiah that's coming. Have confidence in him. Because sometimes life is really hard. But life and judgment belong to the one that died for you. Don't lose sight of that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that life and judgment belong to Christ. Thank you that you have worked out what is going to happen and you've explained to us, Father. We know that to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord, that, Lord, the day that we die, we will be with you in paradise. Lord, we briefly walked through these things today. We didn't dig into any of these passages, but as we look to the resurrection that's to come, the life that's given, the judgment that's coming, most of all, Lord, we just want to have confidence in you.
confidence that you can handle all of our circumstances, confidence that you give life to your children. If there is someone here today, Lord, that does not know Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would change their heart now, that you would intervene, you would give them spiritual life, that they might know you. That they could look forward to the time when our bodies will be resurrected, when we get to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb, when we get to come back and reign with Christ. And Lord, for the believer, help us to be patient. Help us to trust you. Because all life and all judgment belong to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.